we have uh, a, a, a very, very senior uh, panel here. Uh, we have Mr. Bahuguna, and let me start by uh, uh, requesting Mr. Bahuguna, CMD, Railtel, to give us a sense of uh, what is really happening. For example, Railtel plays a big part in NOFN. Okay, another story which uh, has uh, many subtexts to it. Uh, Railtel is uh, an intrinsic part of uh, NOFN, which is, uh, which is what we are banking on to provide or at least help other service providers to uh, you know, uh, use a backbone which takes us all over the country, which covers all the 250,000 gram panchayats and maybe in some parts of the urban areas as well. So uh, let me start with Mr. Bhoguna and give his sense about what's really happening there. Yes, please. Good morning to you, all of you, and thank you, my colleagues on the, yeah, this one? No, he says it will be switched on. Hello? Yeah, okay. Hello? It's okay, fine? Okay. So, uh, thank you very much, my colleagues on the DAS, and mostly thanks to Voice and Data, I meet all these people here frequently. So, that's a good opportunity, because Delhi being a gigantic city, you just can't make even plan to meet people. So, uh, let me come to the topic and thank you, Amita, for creating a complete, a clear background to what's actually happening. Uh, whenever I've been generally discussing in government and other public forums, I ask a basic question. When the mobile went just like uncontrolled and it spread and everybody got a broadband uh, mobile connection, just because sometimes we declared that the incoming calls are free, so we didn't mind giving a phone to your servant or your this fellow, your home, so numbers increased, and somebody paid for it, and it went around. When the broadband thing came, and we thought on the same line, broadband will also grow, but it really did not happen. And the way things are, <coughs> at least I have my apprehension that how far it will happen. So in this area, uh, let's get into the basics. Mobile happened because government let it loose. They allow people to uh, do whatever they want to do and uh, they had some minimum regulation and they got money and uh, everything was done. In the broadband area, something similar is not happening because the incumbents, the telcos, they are probably busy with too many issues which they are dealing as of now that mid course correction on the policy, whatever government is doing. So hardly people have money to spend on broadband. That's, I understand, maybe I have a very little understanding on this area. But being a neutral player outside the main telcos, and all telcos being my customers, I understand, primarily that's the area they're not able to go big way. Second challenge, whatever we found, that the, there are too many restrictions or constraints in creating a broadband. You can't dig, you can't create a network in the city which is required. Radio somehow was created because radio could go, it could jump the hops and you create some minimum fiber infrastructure in the background. Once you do not have a basic infrastructure in cities, naturally broadband is a dream. The area I am living in, it's a VVIP area of Delhi, but I don't get more than 512 kbps, although declared to Mbps, whatever you call it, that's fine. But then you don't get the speed what you really want to call broadband. Now, this issue was debated many times recommended to government to facilitate RW. Don't want to give everybody digging, okay, then create pipes. Give it to the people, people will buy, whatever way. Or create a consortium, they'll create. So in the situation in the cities, almost remain same. Now, understanding this, government understood, okay, cities, whatever is being done, there will be some money, so probably private industry will do something. So they focused on the rural areas because most of the time, or half of the population just, they are on the, don't get anything and it has an impact on education, health, everything. This NOFN project was started. So as he said that we have been associated with it. And it went through its own challenges. The project started and uh, government thought about six last kilometers cable within two years we'll be able to lay. But uh, going back to the data, the total network in India today, the cable which I understand, I may stand corrected, but it's around 10 lakh to 11 lakh kilometers. And uh, not counting figures of Reliance Geo, which, which is recent addition. That could be some other two, three lakh kilometers. So this, out of this, around six lakhs or 6.5 lakhs is only the independent routes. Others are on common routes. Now, that six kilometer doing in two years was naturally a challenge. Then probably, yes, could there be a freedom to do it? Probably, if not six lakhs, two lakhs, something would have been done. 
But now, those things are on track. Whatever issues, they got resolved. Whatever the procedure government follows. And now we are optimistic that this will be done. So this year, 100,000 panchayat getting connected looks optimistic because things are on track. Because see, basic thing is we just cannot see ourselves or even a telco for that matter. Ourselves means I mean a telecom industry sitting here away from the industry. Somebody is supplying the equipment. He has to understand that the equipment is viable at this cost. You can't break the whole project just because you say that I'll supply at some cost and it doesn't work out. So they are the challenges. Broadband has not come. Now, cutting short, I am talking too much. Most of you know this, but this is the background. So rural will happen, and rural will have higher broadband capacity than you are today able to get into cities. Second point is happening. Fiber naturally will take time. It's a good infrastructure. Second issue happening in is earlier the fiber was to be taken till where point it was there. Now we find that the existing fiber has challenges. So the, all the fiber is being now brought back to at least the block headquarter where at least this network becomes clear. So that helps the telco industry also because block headquarters is a known place. They are around only around 6,000 numbers in the country. Right now, I tell you, you come to block headquarters, but my there is a constraint that starts right from that point. So that is a conscious decision uh, government has taken. And uh, it has some challenges, but it will be dealt with. So most of the telcos are available in blocks. I know that around 60, 70% blocks, most of the telcos cover. Some remote areas may not be covering. So that will facilitate overall access on the rural areas. That is as far as no fun is concerned. And once the fiber is there, the technology has already something is planned today. So that's not being undone. So other sort of technology solutions which are upcoming will also be possible. And now government emphasis is, as, OK, you go to fiber to the panchayat. What next? How do you give access? See, no private telco is going to come. We're just working out one day strategy. If one point can give you 10,000 rupees per month, the business is doable. Then anybody will invest on that, one panchayat. So we did the complete exercise and went around. The government can subsidize, if not capex, opex. People will come. Somehow, government has their own challenges. So it came out that let people get educated, particularly with this government. They said, let's focus on digital literacy. Let at least make people digitally aware. So the Wi-Fi thing started from the time it started in a big game and they started even like a political uh, thing that my Wi-Fi will also start. Everybody wanted to start. We had taken some positive actions there and our experience have been really wonderful. These numbers do not count in TRI list. Today we have around 50 lakhs people per month logged into the Wi-Fi which is put around uh, 97 stations. Within another two, three days it will become 100. The 100 stations are large ones like and we expect the number of uh, users will be about uh, one crore once the awareness goes up and we take some drive to make people aware that how to use it. And again, it will be linked to the smartphone population. So at least those people are getting aware. We are on that space. So similarly now, government is saying that, okay, create Wi-Fi infrastructure in rural areas. Once I create Wi-Fi infrastructure, they know that somehow the phone is going to come and phone is going to buy as per his choice or his suggestion and whatever. Now I am thinking that even less than 5,000 rupees the cost, the uh, phone is likely to come. So now the scheme, what government has launched recently is, is coming up that uh, you provide Wi-Fi in every panchayat wherever you have put a fiber point. So at least that area gets a Wi-Fi coverage. You may do a township, uh, total, or otherwise you can create a hotspot, at least whoever are interested can get taste of it. So whoever business comes tomorrow, they know that somebody has something and they can grow further. This is what is going on. And we have also put up a proposal that there are around uh, uh, 4,500 stations today we get connected on the fiber railway stations. Out of that 500 maybe large stations, you may skip them. So or about, they are about 1,000. I said about 4,000 stations are rural. And those stations, if you create, like Wi-Fi today will become like old day PCOs. So those stations, if you create, so they have given us some pilot, about 200 stations. They said, okay, let us see what is the impact of it. I said, people around the place, who come hanging around and like you go to the mall and place, they will be able to have access because you have a secured infrastructure, you have a power supply, and you have a broadband connectivity at the station, which rural today challenge. Even if you take a broadband connection, biggest challenge is where do you get the power supply? So these are issues we are dealing and many people in this area are working. But this Wi-Fi solution and uh, some sort of uh, backhaul, whatever is possible, shall make people literate on broadband 
and it will make the market open for the industry when it comes tomorrow. It's all telcos. So we create a ground for Shyam and all these people when they come in tomorrow. So the people are aware of broadband. Then the application, et cetera, starts. I think I'll stop here, and uh, there are other areas we can discuss later if we have time. Thank you. Uh, am I heard? Yeah, okay. no. Uh, that, uh, there are some glitches, of course, uh, which have been uh, holding back uh, your fiber uh, outreach, uh, impacting NFN and other works. But I think some glitches are being sorted out. Uh, and there is uh, hope that going further, uh, the work that Railtel is doing would actually uh, enable us to get better connected and faster than what we have done before. Uh, so that's the sense that I get it. But OK, let me just move on to Airtel. Uh, being the largest service provider that we have in the country, having done so much uh, uh, of connectivity all over, the largest ISPs as well, uh, apart from the mobile numbers. Uh, what is your sense, uh, Shyam, uh, on uh, where we are? And as Akhil said in the morning, uh, uh, we need to do it by 2020. If we don't, we'll miss the bus. Okay, so we have been missing the bus last 20 years a lot of times, but we have also been leapfrogging as well. So where do we stand and where do we go from here? Thanks. Thank you, Amitabh. Uh, so let me... You made this statement a couple of times on, on, the, on the reality check. Let me take a slightly counter view on, on painting a positive outlook on what we've been doing since last 20 years as an industry, as a country, uh, as an economy on top of it. So from an entitlement perspective today, we are 18, 19% of world population. And uh, Amitabh did allude to the number 350 million of internet users, second biggest population. But from a total internet population in the world, that's still 9%. So 9%. 18% of the total population vis a vis 9% of internet population. So from an entitlement perspective, we're just half there. We need to cover half that space fast enough. Have we gone fast enough? Are we going fast enough? And I, I am a bit repetitive here, but I, I come back to my favorite 3V story because we've run really, really fast on, on, on that as far as I'm concerned. And all of us who've been there for this while, we've seen this happen. And we should not take away the credit from all of us as an industry together, as a, as a, as a, as a country together. If you recall, Late 90s, early 2000, 2001, we were sitting at almost near zero kind of mobile telephone density, sub 1% kind of thing. 2001 to 2010, we stretched out, we slogged, we created some fiber, we used microwave, we laid out towers and, and etc. 1 billion was the number we achieved by end of 2010. So from almost zero to a billion. This was the first decade in this century and I call it the story of the first V and this first V was voice. We had managed in that first decade to connect almost every Indian from a reach and connectivity perspective. I mean, there are people using dual SIMs and we still, there are still hinterlands in, in Andhra Pradesh, Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh, where we have not got into. But 98, 99% of population coverage is, is not a bad deal to start when, when you only have 10 years to do. So first 10 years, story of first we voice, we ended up as a country connecting a billion users. 2010, the famous 3G auctions happened. We had tasted a bit of data at that point of time. And, and I would come back to the point which I'm just making is, I think at this point of time, we need to redefine what broadband is. Because we always kind of anchor it back to the classical wireline definition of old broadband, and, and then we start beating ourselves black and blue. 2011, 3G started. We started to see some traction. Smartphones also started coming. And that's, that's another big, the big point, which, which, which I'll come just in a while. MBPS, 1 MBPS, 2 MBPS kind of tentative speeds in, in urban centers. Five years later, as we sit 2016, we are already talking about 100 plus MBPS speeds on the devices. We have already moved from tentative 3G to almost ubiquitous carrier aggregated 4G, where you're seeing the three or four states we ourselves have launched carrier aggregated 4G. One device can consume 100, 112, 135 MBPS speed. This is only going to grow. So this is decade two, 2011 to 2020, and this is the decade of video. And when I say video, video in most countries, actually all across the planet, is a surrogate of data today. 60 to 65 percent of the data consumption coming on video. It could be streamed video, consumed video, user-generated video, FaceTime video, whichever flavor it is. But it's close to 60, 65 percent is going to grow. 1 Mbps to 100 Mbps, maybe by 2020 we might hit close to Gbps kind of speeds. This is where the second decade is going to end. I'll, I'll just stretch it further for my story of third V which is where this whole digital India and reality might start kicking in, 2021 to 2030. This would be the decade of third V when we're talking about near GBPS speeds, sub millisecond latency to, to each one of us. We're talking about the era or decade of virtual reality. That's the third V. And when I say virtual reality, I don't mean those Oculus kind of games on, on, on top of your head for real uh, 
techno geeks, it would be a virtual reality from a digital life perspective. Almost, almost all, every transaction which we as a society would start making, 100% sure for urban and semi-urban, it would be a bit later in the decade for rural and deep rural. Almost every transaction will be virtual. And it would be virtual not from a textual online transaction, it would be as fulfilling as it's a real transaction. That's where the virtual reality kicks in. This is an amazing journey. If you look at these 30 years from a 50,000 feet view, almost zero density to, to giving a GBPS kind of speed to every mobile. What has led this? What are the challenges? There are big, big challenges also. And again, anchoring back to the reality check. This famous um, centuries old Zeno's paradox, the next step is always half of the first one. That's, that's where the most progress happens. I mean, if, if I cover 100 miles in the first hour, I'll cover 50 miles in the next hour. Every, every last mile starts getting tougher and tougher and, and, and more difficult to connect. What is driving this? Consumer. The things that are happening in, in our country, in an economy, more from a consumption perspective. It could be entertainment, it could be education, it could be banking, it could be payments, it could be uh, retail, it could be ticketing, it could be connectivity, basic connectivity. The need is greater than ever at this point of time and only going to get better. The devices, 250, 300 million smartphones in our billion population and close to 200, 200 million plus getting shipped every year. This is going to change the game again. And if you look at the capabilities, and I was, I was Googling the capability of a smartphone 10 years back, as early as 2006, and that's not far back. I don't know if you recall, there was a new phone called N71, N72, which Nokia came in in 2006, big hoopla around it. 200 megahertz of processor, 200 MB of capacity, and if you are lucky, uh, you would get, what, 20, 30 kbps of connected speed. Now, that 20, 30 kbps of connected speed is easily in urban centers 20 mbps speed today in 4G scenario, 1,000 times more. That 200 MB of uh, storage is 256 GB of storage which you carry in your pocket, again, 1,000 times more. Those 200 mbps single core processor is now five, six, eight gigahertz of uh, quad core processor, eight, ten, I'm talking about one of the latest processor. So 1,000 times processing, 1,000 times bandwidth, 1,000 times memory is a billion number. So the device has grown from a capability perspective billion times. And imagine 300 of those billion times more powerful devices sitting in the network today. The amount of information they can suck in, they can consume, they can process. So consumer is there, the vehicle as in device is there. And the ubiquity, now, <coughs> sorry, close to 400, 400,000 <coughs> towers today host more than two and a half, three million base stations in this country. Now these three million base stations each capable to serve multiple MBPS if not GBPS to the customer with those super smartphones. I think we have a, we have a good story to, to, to start with. The challenges and, and, and Mr. Bahuguna alluded to some of them. I think we need to stitch our our policy act in a more more forward looking and I'm sure Akhil, Akhil also spoke about spectrum is expensive, right of way of putting a fiber is, is, is very fragmented to start with. There have been now some policy interventions which is happening which is a common right of way. Uh, so we, Shyam, what I'll do is uh, I'll just cut you here. Uh, I would come to that question about what we need to do to go further. Fair enough. So I think that would be another round of discussion that we can have. Fair so fairly quickly wrap up the other sure. part, of the, this part of the discussion first. So I'll come back to this exact thing that I have in mind uh, is what do we do next? Yep. What are the policy hiccups or regulatory hiccups or uh, things that the industry needs to do, things that the government needs to do uh, to leapfrog into that, those numbers that we're talking about. So I'll come back to that. Thank but you. Just, just, just one last yeah. statement on this. We, when I said we want to redefine broadband, I think two or three acts need to be taken very, very together if you look at broadband going forward. Broadband should be the ubiquity of connectivity and ease of connectivity with respect to whatever information you need. If a 1 Mbps, 2 Mbps connectivity is good enough for me to watch a good video on my device and make all uh, internet-based or digital-based transactions right, why do I keep redefining the, the, the broadband as a, as a, as a cutoff speed? I think we should relook at it, one from a wireless and wireline perspective, and also we need to relook at it from a uh, speed of connectivity perspective. It should be more customer experience based rather than the vehicle or, or quality of vehicle based. I think that will drive a more intuitive and insightful uh, measurement of how broadband is penetrating. Okay, here. so what you're saying is that uh, instead of uh, redefining, so for example, I personally believe that 512 kbps definition of broadband in India is pretty bad. Okay, and TRA having stuck to it is also, uh, was something of a surprise for me, because I thought they will at least go up to 2 Mbps. Mm -hmm. So what I get a sense from you is that you need not do that, 
Uh, it is more about uh, you know uh, how we utilize bandwidth, uh, their customer more, uh, experience, bandwidth, uh, optimization techniques today. So you might get a better experience with lesser bandwidth uh, capability or lesser uh, broadband speeds. Is what you're saying? Okay. So we'll probably have some differences of opinion there uh, and among the audience, but that's uh, uh, one aspect of it. Okay. So let me just move on to Partho, uh, um, uh, old friend from uh, the 90s. Uh, okay. Uh, from Hughes Communication. Uh, I think there was a lot of expectations uh, for the satellite players to come in and uh, using VSATs to connect remote areas uh, where the fiber wouldn't go or the terrestrial lines wouldn't go. So what's your sense from the uh, VSAT communication perspective as to where we have moved? Uh, and yeah. further? Thanks, Amitabh. Yeah. Now, I think uh, uh, we have been in this satellite communication business in the country since 94. So we have a long journey. One of the first licenses in telecom after NTP 1994. Now, I would actually like to talk uh, specifically on the broadband, uh, which is the subject today, and digital India. And I think uh, in the broadband uh, area, I would really like to, uh, rather than talk about, uh, uh, put some facts, rather than talk about numbers, and put some facts. And I see some disconnects in some of those way we have been uh, thinking or working on this for the last uh, uh, this years. Of course, I am from the satellite industry. I'm going to talk about the way the satellite is, go is solving these issues across the world and some of that. So fundamentally, I think, uh, you know, we have a dichotomy where we are saying that 512 kbps is a uh, broadband speed. Uh, and uh, when we are talking of uh, gram panchayats connecting on the digital India, we're talking of 100 mbps. Uh, so, uh, which is almost about 350 GB per day. Uh, you know, telecom is, uh, uh, is, a, is like a transportation. We need uh, planes, we need uh, trains, we also need bullet trains, uh, we also need roads. And uh, I think uh, all this uh, idea about the broadband across digital India, all across is fantastic. Uh, I definitely believe that every child in our rural village or remote village has to have that internet connection to make uh, the country prosper. And, but so is the roads and, and so is the power. But under the limited resources, and we have seen what has happened in the power, what has happened in the roads. So under the limited resources, and uh, it is extremely important that we explore, uh, we don't have to go full hog on 100 Mbps per uh, gram panchayat and trying to do it on the fiber and things like that. Uh, there, are, there are alternate technologies, uh, uh, which I'm talking of community broadband, I'm, I mean shared broadband. I'm not talking of consumer broadband, which is like a mobile or a home broadband. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a shared broadband. And I think uh, satellite plays a very, very important role in that space. We haven't been able to use the satellites uh, so much because uh, I'll give you the reasons. Today in US, the most wired country uh, there are about 15 million homes which are uh, unserved or underserved. And there are two private satellite operators or service operators who build their own satellites, who build their own ground segments, and they are connecting about 75,000 on an average per month, these homes in the country, in the US, the most wired country in the world. Uh, I think those opportunities are uh, not there, and, and those connectivities are and 20 Mbps and 25 Mbps uh, uh, service levels on the satellite. Uh, I think uh, we feel that uh, while we do have done about 100,000 GPs, on the digital India I'm talking about, 100,000 GPs by March 27, I think it's about 10,000 which is uh, live and on fiber. And uh, another 55,000 I think is about connected on fiber but not yet live and hopefully we'll be able to do a substantial part of it by March 2017. But then there is another 150,000. And then there are almost about 40, 50,000 in the hilly areas, uh, infested areas, insurgency areas, uh, islands, and various other areas. They have not uh, really looked at that. So I feel that I'm, with some of this, the government has really started looking into some of these things. Uh, but, uh, but I feel that uh, one of the major constraints which is coming up is uh, also the availability of the satellites and uh, over the country. Though there are lots of capacity by the foreign satellites and everybody else, 
uh, we still do not follow the NTP-99 satellite policy to have an open sky the way NTP-99 uh, envisages that. So neither the investments are coming in the satellite. Today, in the terms of satellite technology, we are about 20 years uh, behind, which doesn't happen in 3G, which doesn't happen in 4G, and sure not will happen in 5G. Uh, and Indian satellites today are at about two gigabits uh, capacity. The world is making satellites of 200 gigabits capacity. And when you launch manufacturing cost and launch cost and insurance cost is same, you are actually getting a factor of one is to 100 in terms of cost per bit benefit. I think that's an area which uh, uh, definitely we have to look into. A lot of this digital India, we definitely have to look into the satellite as an opportunity. But I know the government policymakers are looking into it also seriously, apart from even hilly areas or uh, islands or insurgency areas. But uh, there is not enough capacity, and we haven't been able to build it on that. So there has to be a re really relook on the policy on this. And when I'm talking about digital India, I think one of the more important thing is which is coming up is the make in India. Uh, we have, uh, and also coupled with the GST introductions, every trader, every SME has to upload his invoice into the system. And all these SMEs, all these traders are all remotely located across the country, and they do not have any connectivity today. And most of them do not have that connectivity. And uh, 3G, 4G, wherever it is there, whichever the coverage, I think, I don't know, maybe 37% or something, uh, will be able to do it. But, but then it's a legislation. It's a GST. You have to, you have to follow you, to get VAT credits and these things. You have to have that capability. So I think there is some serious uh, uh, challenges on, uh, on this area. And uh, we feel that uh, we really need to relook how we can leapfrog on one technology, at least one media, which has also not been talked about much, I know, uh, where it can be done. Today, we, are, we understand the ecosystems of rural India. The satellite providers are providing almost about 250,000 uh, business broadband for for banking, branches, all across, the, all across the country. Far remote areas, even 24 hours from the nearest railhead. You know, those type of uh, ecosystem. You have to struggle on the power. You have to struggle on the uh, manpower, repair, infrastructure. But it is being done. DTH is, again, another uh, this thing which has done extremely well. So I think uh, uh, to meet up to this digital India, make in India, all these SMEs, GSTs, regulations, I feel that we need to really seriously look at rural side of our digital divide and uh, bring in some good uh, latest technologies. And satellite really becomes a, I'm giving an example, one is to 100 cost level. Uh, something seriously has to be done to bring in very fast. I, I know that the policymakers are looking at it, but I think we can definitely meet some of those December 2018 targets on uh, digital India. Uh, if satellite capacity, even the current satellite capacity is over the sky, uh, is being, which is controlled, uh, which is being uh, deregulated as per the policies and can be done. Okay, so Partho, a lot of things that you said resonate with me because uh, when I used to help run uh, ISVI, uh, late 90s uh, onwards, uh, we used to interact very often with your industry association, which was the VSAT association. And there were, I understand, uh, uh, even then, and we tried to be supportive of the fact that you had uh, a limited skies policy. For example, you were uh, uh, still probably uh, made to go through the Department of Space, so you're constrained on capacities that you can utilize, you, can, you are constrained on the satellites that you can uh, uh, bank upon. Uh, but as ISP Association in the 1999 uh, NTP, uh, we had managed for the ISP industry to get an open skies policy done. But I don't know, somehow that didn't really percolate down to the other segments of the industry at that point of time. Yeah, that, uh, that happened because of the international gateways. Correct. Uh, the Department of Space doesn't have the satellite which covers beyond India. So because of the international gateways, you could get that uh, open sky. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's there in the policy, but uh, uh, it's yeah, policy so the been point implemented. Was, the uh, process made in such a way that the policy is not truly reflected in the right. processes. And I think uh, my sense is, again, uh, that even though we have done well with the use of fiber, and we talk about it all the time, the use of uh, mobile technology to reach uh, to the farthest corners of the country, uh, VSATs and satellite have not really been used to their potential for many, many reasons. And I think it will come back to when we try and wrap the whole thing about what next uh, and some of the suggestions that can come through uh, for different technologies to be utilized properly is something that we can dwell on.
Okay, uh, so uh, Ankit, uh, what is your sense now as uh, someone who helps most of the service providers to uh, put everything together uh, and provide uh, services to the customer segment? Uh, what do you see uh, the industry uh, doing next? Uh, how does it go forward? Hello. Hello. Uh, so firstly, thank you, uh, Voice and Data, and, uh, for having us over. Uh, so just want to give a quick background in terms of uh, Sterlite. Uh, we position ourselves as one of the leading digital infra providers uh, in the country. Uh, we're extremely excited about the opportunity that lies ahead of us. Uh, we're also from a very interesting vantage position. We actually supply into uh, 80 countries today in terms of our fiber and cable solutions, uh, both to ISPs, operators, as well as to the governments. Uh, so because of that, we're able to not only evaluate and see very closely what the operators in India are doing and government, but also what are the kind of broadband projects happening and how the deployments are happening to make these broadband targets happen. So we've seen some very interesting deployment technologies in Europe, uh, in the USA, and of course, uh, China we track very closely. Uh, we also have operations in India, China, and Brazil. So again, through that, we're able to track very closely what's happening. So I just want to highlight three or four numbers uh, that we find uh, both interesting and exciting. Uh, in any given year, uh, uh, in the last few years, China is deploying 10, uh, 12 times more fiber uh, per year uh, compared to India. Uh, they recently crossed about uh, 600 million 4G users, uh, moving very closely towards a billion users. Uh, Singapore was a very interesting example as well. Uh, we've seen that uh, operators, all the ISPs are offering 1 Gbps already, and the biggest debate now is that are there use cases for 10 Gbps? So that's, that's the kind of mindset that we're finding very interesting and a small city of Singapore is doing 20,000 kilometers of, uh, of a fiber rollout over the next three years. Uh, so it's again, very interesting focus on how the broadband should be happening. Uh, one of the other key trends that the operators are seeing is uh, already 75% of the revenue is coming through data and 20, 25% is coming through voice, while that's the inverse in, uh, in India. And on that point alone, I think there's the tremendous opportunity for all of us uh, in the country. Uh, we talked about customer experience, which uh, Sanjay talked about. Clearly, uh, that is going to be the biggest factor going forward. How, each, how do each of the operators differentiate themselves in terms of customer experience? Uh, how do they deploy the best networks, the most flexible networks, and the ubiquitous networks uh, that we talked about? But also, India has some of the most unique challenges that we've seen globally. We have the lowest ARPU in the world. We have the highest spectrum cost in the world. Uh, we have a, a vast majority of population still to be connected. Uh, we have uh, highest, one of the highest interest rates in the world, um, and uh, you know the amount of debt, the leverage that we have is about 4.2 times today in terms of debt to EBITDA. So from various aspects, the operators themselves are constrained uh, in terms of how they can uh, invest in the networks. So I think this is a very interesting transition phase we're going through because we have a large operator that's just come in offering free services. And uh, I just want to highlight two things that we found very interesting uh, with the launch of uh, Reliance Geo. The first thing we found very interesting was once they launched it, although it's free, um, we found that the amount of data per user being used was tremendous. We're hearing numbers of 10 to 15 times of what we typically see in the country. And that was also on per user basis the highest in the world uh, that we could see in terms of some of the research reports. The second thing that we saw very interestingly in the railways was that once uh, uh, Google and Railtel got together, uh, the, the usage of data was 10 times more than what was originally expected uh, per user. And in fact, uh, in my home city in Pune, uh, we find that the biggest problem we have in Pune station is today because the entire station is just packed uh, with students and uh, all kinds of people who are just coming in uh, to use and they're not even paying the, uh, the, the fees to enter the station. So, so it's a very interesting phenomenon that we're seeing that clearly there's a tremendous 10 times, 100 times unmet need of this data, and really the challenge for the operators how to bring it at the lowest cost to serve today. So with that, I would just pause there and we'll come to the solutions uh, in the next part. So you touch a chord when you talk about uh, how a free service like Geo is yes. actually enabling people to use data uh, with a free mind, right? Absolutely. Uh, and using it in, um, in a way that we have always wished. But uh, certain constraints have come in, which is uh, as a consumer, when I wear my hat of a consumer on, uh, I'll say I'm very conscious of the data that I use on my mobile because I pay a lot for it. Yes. Okay, so as you rightly said, I think, and someone said in the inaugural session also, customer uh, delight is what we have to work towards. Now, 
customer delight, unless that happens, that's one of the basic tenets. Uh, unless that happens, uh, where the customer is free of his tension about how much he's going to pay for the amount of data that he uses, uh, this transformation into Digital India may not even uh, become a reality because when you are doing so much uh, yes. on the net, uh, online, when you are expected to do everything online, uh, including your banking and with all this uh, the monetization thing that we are talking about, uh, I'm referring from D or re or whatever uh, uh, suffixes. Uh, I think there's going to be a tremendous uh, uh, upsurge only if we come to a situation where people feel it's price, uh, mm. uh, you know, uh, uh, it's a fair price that one is paying. Now today what happens is that if I as a user uh, is also paying a good amount of money uh, to get the limited data that I have, I'm also concerned with fair usage policies, right? Uh, and I think again some reports suggest that uh, so these are some of the most restrictive uh, FUPs in the world, okay? Now does that really augur well for users to be using uh, uh, their connectivity to the full potential? So that's something that is uh, uh, what we need to uh, think about as well, as an industry, of course. How do we delight the customer and not constrain him on those uh, sides? But at the same time, economics is involved, I understand, because uh, there is economics, you have to be realistic, you have to understand the commercials, you have to make sure that the uh, industry also makes enough surplus to you know, uh, uh, keep the business continuing. So yes, uh, I think... Yeah. I'll just make one last point on that. I think uh, there's a very big difference between uh, showcasing the value to the urban users versus the rural users. I think urban users get it, the kids get it, the college kids get it, and they want more. I think the challenge we will face and where I'm again very excited about is what are those applications that will drive that demand where people right. see that I can get data about the cl closest market where I can get crop rates, any of the weather forecasts, any of that data which helps them get more income, save money, that's where they'll see value and then apply for the data. And again, with price points of handsets, et cetera, coming down, I think it's, it's only going to explode. Right. OK. Great. So, uh, Sergey, last but not least, uh, I think you have heard uh, all the uh, Indian operators and uh, technology providers uh, discuss about uh, where we stand uh, as India uh, in terms of where we have arrived uh, in the last 20, 22 years. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of expectations now. Uh, we want a lot uh, to happen very soon. Now, as MTS, uh, what has been your experience uh, uh, in India? India is a very diverse country in many, many ways, economically, socially, you know, uh, expectation-wise. Uh, it's not a homogeneous society as many other countries. So there are different sets of demands and different sets of market uh, plays that happen. So it's not an easy market to uh, be operating in. So what's your experience now? Okay. <laughs> Great. Uh, That's good to know. <laughs> I don't think we are. Can you just help him here? Yeah? Ah. Okay, yes. now it's better. So what I'm saying, so I'm some kind of the blended animals. So last eight years I was in mobile broadband, but I started from fixed line. And I'm a finance person, I'm not a technical person. But I strongly believe that fixed line always has an advantage over mobile in terms of the speed, reliability, and security. And that's by default. So uh, that also means we need all type of the internet connections. We need satellite. So I think in early 2000 probably people thought the satellite is almost dead. Yes, it's 
killed by mobile. Now it's coming back. Just yesterday I read that uh, SoftBank in investing $1 billion in satellite company in Europe. It's just another confirmation what you did say. Uh, mobile, great technology, faster rollout, a lot of advantages, but each technology serves for a particular customer segment. For heavy customers, fixed line, Wi-Fi is better serving. All technologies evolving, improving their speed and capacity. Trying to catch up each another. But there is almost uh, unavoidable situation. The uh, demand on data and broadband the data will grow up dramatically. So we are not counting, I completely agree, we are not counting by uh, MBs. We are counting by GBs now. Can mobile with the cost of uh, the spectrum and the level of the development of the technology provide that speed? It's not possible yet. Might be somewhere in future, maybe. We also discussed strategically what is the future of Wi-Fi against uh, fiber optic, against mobile standing in between. It's still there is a place for Wi-Fi. For everybody, still a lot of the place. We also see our development uh, now, I would say, probably a little bit more than India. We are looking now on our development of our operator in Russia. And we are just thinking, so voice is not going up, it's going down. Revenues of the voice from year to year going down. That's also unavoidable. Data opens a lot of opportunities, but uh, it's also a lot of uh, capacity requirement, a lot of investments, and it has to be cheap to be affordable. That's another challenge. Monetization and data is another challenge. Talking about Wi-Fi, I think monetization for public Wi-Fi is the major challenge so far. So that's... Uh, First statement, all technologies would be useful at that time. Sure. Yep. And um, we have to go there. But you said you, there will be another part on the improvements. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you, Sergey. I think, yes, uh, there are challenges, yes, uh, and I think they'll be all met, and we have uh, seen that happen over the last uh, more than a couple of decades, yes. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll quickly uh, go through another one round, and uh, we've heard, uh, you know, all the constraints that we have, and we have also heard that uh, we are all very bullish about what we are going to do next and how we are going to do it. Uh, but to answer that question about uh, better about how to do it, uh, there are some constraints that we heard about uh, that everyone has voiced, uh, which is in terms of possibly some policy tweaks that we probably need to do to go through the next transformation phase. Uh, so uh, one by one, okay, uh, Mr. Bauguna, uh, anything that you would, you know, a couple of uh, policy or regulatory issues that you want to flag, uh, which we should address immediately uh, so that it helps in our quest to move forward on the Digital India vision. Yeah. Hello. Hello, Audible. Okay, fine. Uh, thank you. Now, just hearing them, certain things like um, uh, most of the policies required for uh, uh, rolling out of broadband services are in place. Mm -hmm. I don't think much is required other than facilitating the city access network, which like uh, one of the reasons why no fund did not happen was I, we still do not have permission for about 400 uh, sites from government because we thought uh, that ROW is given free and agreement has been signed. And later on we realized that railways say, no, you can't cross my track, I am central government. So central government had a policy where central government created. Same thing with NHEI, same thing with oil companies. Every crossing they want an insurance of 3 crore rupees. I said, take a lump sum insurance of 100 crore rupees. But then the system is system and the process is process. With private operators face day in and day out, we thought we will not face. But uh, all have been the issue. It's not pointing out one, but there have been others. You thought there will be a fiber, but there is no fiber. Now you say, okay, go further to the block. It helps otherwise in the ecosystem. So policy-wise, at least there have been a very uh, positive drive. It is being driven by PMO. And every issue getting resolved and threadbare dealt with. So broadband perspective, other than the cities, still they are not able to deal with, but they have issued now a policy. Right. For ROW, new policy has come in, and which will 
yeah, like it will be like earlier telecom policy where you could erect a pole wherever you want it, something like that. So let's wait a while for the policy to, that, uh, that to issue. take shape and see how it works. Only thing is, also it has been taken that uh, there are certain areas which will be covered only by satellite. I'll give you an example, Arunachal Pradesh we are working, where a realtor is like working in all difficult areas. So uh, Arunachal now there is a village 100 kilometer away, 90 kilometer away to be precise, has a population of 100. How do you connect that? Then I asked DOT whether it is worth spending on fiber or due to alternative. We said, leave these all areas, you will come with satellite. So as far as Mr. Partho is concerned, there is a lot of satellite going to happen, but they are open. I said, why say some technology cannot deal with? Sure. So that's the policy front, things are happening. And one more thing what government is doing is like, they know that the Wi-Fi being spectrum uh, neutral, I will say you don't have to pay for spectrum. So stations, there was a pressure so that more people travel over there, let them have feel of it. Now they have come with universities, they want to connect. Every state government and probably uh, will be working very soon on that. Central universities, they are doing, state universities, they are trying to fund. Actually the challenge is the money, capex. So the moment you go in an OPEX model, government is okay with that. And we, we are the strong proponents of OPEX model. But the moment once government spends the capex, then it becomes government property, then the maintenance of the asset, all these things become very expensive. You make a service model, fine, no issue on that. So that is the area also which is being dealt with, so probably universities they are doing. So they are going to make it more and more available. But then what is happening is, it's a access we are dealing with, further access. But then backhaul to that access is still a challenge all over India for everybody. So that's being dealt with. Uh, thank you, Mr. Babaguna. Uh, uh, Sham, a uh, couple of points uh, where uh, we should improve. If we all understand it's a very infrastructure intensive industry. You, you can't reach out until you put in a lot of infrastructure on the ground. Uh, and the ubiquity and the customer experience we are talking about, the network has to continuously move closer to the customer. So these are the two fundamental guidelines on which this whole journey is going to take place. And what would facilitate it? Um, three things uh, at a very high level. First is in this ARPU challenged, economically challenged market, how do you ensure that the cost of doing business you can still keep your head above the water. So cost of spectrum, cost of right of ways, and, and those kind of things have to be slightly holistically looked into. That's the first part. Second part, if the cost of doing business is OK, is what is the ease of doing business? Today, and again, Mr. Bhayuna very rightly alluded that even a government uh, agency like Railtel has problems to get permissions across sectors. Can we cut across sectors? Can there be a unified right-of-way policy? And again, uh, DOT has just laid out a right-of-way policy, and I hope it, it gets the right traction in the states and in the other, other agencies. But if we have those kind of ubiquitous policies, it would be much, much faster to, to, to go. And third, I think it's high time we start tagging telecom as an essential service. We tag electricity as an essential service, water as an essential service. So, Moving back to the national language, if, if, if we want to move from the next level of actualization, so there is this roti kapda or makan and the next level is pani bijli or telecom. So unless you have that pani bijli or telecom embedded together as a, as a common essential requirement to go anywhere, OCs, if you, if you need an OC in a building, you need water readiness, you need electricity readiness. Right. Do you need telecom readiness today? If it doesn't, then, then you can always go back and complain that I, I don't get connectivity, I don't have fiber, I don't have broadband connectivity and all that. So unless it gets tagged as essential service, cost of doing business, ease of doing business, and making telecom essential. I think if we can align in these three aspects, I think we would set up a global example, if not 2020, very soon nearby. Thank Great. you. Uh, Partho? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I agree on that, uh, absolutely. Uh, one thing I think we need, really need to differentiate that uh, uh, home broadband is very different from a, uh, uh, let's say, business type of broadband requirement, which actually we generally cater to. And uh, I agree with Sajay, which he said that whether uh, wireless can really take up that home broadband. Today, home broadband, broadband with children at home possibly has gone to about 80, 100 GB a month. Uh, level with all the videos and Facebook and various uploads and things like that. And I think that's a huge, huge capacity uh, to manage on a uh, uh, wireless. So I think we definitely have to have a good solutions on the home broadband side with uh, cable and uh, fiber. And uh, that, that definitely needs to speed up. And I don't think the telcos are really uh, pushing that very aggressively at the moment, except on the catchment areas or the 
you know, condominium, condo areas and things like that. On the, on the rural broadband and uh, digital India and uh, all these areas, I feel that, uh, as I said, I agree with uh, Mr. Bhavaguna that policy makers are aware of it. It is not one technology which will fit in all, which was initially thought that everything is going to be fiber and uh, we lost a lot of years on that. I think the current policy uh, makers are really looking at alternatives. Um, and also one alternative which comes up, apart from microwave or some, some backhaul areas, I think is the satellite. And they're seriously looking at the satellite, but uh, today we have uh, the constraint of non-availability of the capacity and also the policy to uh, promote private sectors to start providing this, as it is happening in a country like US. Uh, I said 75,000 a month. Uh, connectivities through satellite. So those policies and those framework, if they come up, I think uh, not only the hilly areas and remote areas, which is about 40,000 GPs under uh, uh, your Bharat net, uh, there will be many other areas uh, which can be initially be targeted with the satellite, meet our objectives, and then you can, the advantage of a satellite communication is also that you can move. Uh, move it to a backup, move it to other areas. Okay. Uh, it's easily chin put changeable and, and your investment, there is no capex in the ground and investment on the ground. So uh, the policymakers are looking at it, uh, definitely, but uh, the road is challenging and, yes. and the way forward is challenging and I see a serious concern in meeting 2018 December objective of putting another 150,000 GPs, even if you meet 100,000 by March which is also a little question mark. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So very quickly, uh, Anket, uh, uh, a couple of points, and I think I've been, I've been getting indications to wrap up fast, because we also have to take a couple of questions from the audience, I guess. So, uh, sure. uh, quick. Two things from our side. Uh, number one, uh, without a doubt, we see a, a positive change in the mindset. I think with this government, clearly one of the first things our Prime Minister said is, this government will be known for digital highways. So. Uh, the mindset is there, it's very positive. Uh, a lot of our recent interactions have been around looking at this as broadband as a utility, uh, along the lines of what Sham said. Um, and, and clearly, you know, we never thought of ki agar, uh, if you have to put a road or if you have to put a power line or put gas, that what should be the return on investment. And I think the same way the mindset should be of the government, that I need to invest uh, in making broadband happen and wherever it's required, I'm not going to first look at what's the return, I'm going to do it because it's essentially required for the citizens. I think that's a pretty strong uh, mindset change. We talked about uh, a very uh, positive gazette getting released on right away. Uh, I think the industry really needs to get together with the government, center state level, to just make sure the implementation happens. We need the tower companies with us. We need the fiber companies, ISPs, uh, satellite, everyone to go together and then really find a way to implement this because Clearly, that will be a massive uh, positive move, especially in the cities. And, and our estimates are less than, uh, you know, 15% of uh, the road network or below road network has fiber in it today in the city. So clearly, a lot needs to happen. Right. Uh, third part is we believe that uh, less than 20% of our towers are fiberized today in the country versus maybe 60-70% required for a high-quality 4G network, especially at the scale that the operators are talking about. And again, there the operators need support along with us. Uh, to find ways to really expedite this, uh, you know, as soon as possible. Um, and really, last part, I think uh, we're seeing a very good uh, uh, demand on the digital side also from the smart cities. Uh, clearly, smart cities, uh, all the consultants as well as the states are realizing that uh, 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 fiber network is essential at the core to provide any of these services, the smart services that we're talking about. Uh, just one example is, is Nagpur that we're seeing almost a 800 or 1,000 kilometer network of fiber just in, in one smart city. So clearly, uh, the, the interest and knowledge is, is only increasing, and we, we should work together to make it happen. Thank you, Ankit. Yeah. Uh, Sajay, any last thoughts? Now I would use... It's on? It's on? Yeah, but uh, I completely agree it has to be support and, uh, from the regulator, but it should to be financially feasible model. Mm -hmm. Then it will push everybody because that is a compulsory component of this model. It has to be partnership between all type of the operators, mm -hmm. mobile, satellite, uh, and fixed line. Mm -hmm. uh, for Airtel, it's easy. You have <laughs> some inside. Um, and uh, I also used to think so, think big and small. 
need to be some small practical step. So we just, for example, we talk to real estate uh, developers. It's very easy. It's free for them to put fiber optic when they do construction. Mm -hmm. But do they all think about that? So in Russia, for example, you could not actually, uh, the commission will not accept your construction unless it's connected to the city network. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Okay. Thank you, Sajay. Okay. So uh, we've heard the panelists here. Uh, two questions because we are out of time. Uh, quickly. Okay. Uh, sir. Uh, please uh, 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 tell us who you're addressing the question to. Okay. <laughs> My question is to Sham. You mentioned that uh, why we re redefine the broadband. So do you feel that 512 kbps, which is right, right now the definition, is it okay? Especially seeing that uh, 60 to 70 percent is video content on internet and countries world over have minimum of 20 mbps and uh, the telecom policy also wanted 2 mbps which should have already come. No, absolutely no. So 512 is uh, a low speed by all standards. I think we all kind of violate. Or, or is it okay for mobile? I mean, no, if it you is, want to. No, it is, it, is, it, is, it is not beyond the point with the kind of screen size mobiles are coming and the kind of HD quality video people are looking at. The point I was making is slightly different. The point, so if we look at our fiber or our, our wireline connections, we have more than a million, million and a half connections right now. And we are now striving to provide them 40 Mbps kind of speeds at home. And we are... But the point which um, uh, someone alluded earlier is what is the right speed and what is the requirement for it. Uh, unless we as a society, as a company, start, as an as a industry start matching the requirement with uh, uh, what is getting consumed, it would be very difficult for us to benchmark ourselves. We keep on increasing the speed, we'll say 1, G, 1 MBP is the right speed, 2 MBP is in the right speed. We would be chasing a totally different target rather than connecting more people in a more ubiquitous, in a more holistic manner to let them consume what they want. So one is you, you definitely need to get to the higher and higher speeds and I believe it's only a matter of time before these numbers will become irrelevant. Uh, wireless speeds are more than 1, 5, 10 Mbps. As far as 4G is concerned, there are 10 Mbps plus kind of speeds. Wireline is already giving you 40 Mbps plus kind of speeds. But how much does a customer really want and what do the customer really wants it for? If we start marrying this to the speeds, I think we'll have a bigger and a better view of the world from a, from a penetration and pervasiveness of mobile data perspective. That's the point I'm making. Thank you. Any last questions, please? Uh, I think none. So uh, I'll just quickly wrap it up. Thank you so much, uh, panelists, uh, for a very, very uh, comprehensive view. Uh, and I think uh, what is immersed for voice and data is to actually collect uh, all these thoughts uh, and you know, how to uh, go forward and make Digital India happen. Uh, the sense is that it may not happen in two, three years. Uh, that's impossible because sometimes we make the mistake of uh, trying to act too fast and try to get things fast. And it's short-term thinking. I think we need to move towards the longer-term thinking. And then if we put policies in place uh, and work on regulations and ground realities uh, with a longer-term view, we would probably do better. Thank you so much. Uh, and